Chapter 4 The Bison Hunt When I got back to my father and mother and was sitting up there in our teepee, my face was still all puffed and my legs and arms were badly swollen, but I felt good all over and wanted to get right up and run around. My parents would not let me. They told me I had been sick twelve days, lying like dead all the while, and that whirlwind chaser who was Standing Bear's uncle and a medicine man, had brought me back to life. I knew it was the grandfathers in the flaming rainbow teepee who had cured me, but I felt afraid to say so. My father gave Whirlwind Chaser the best horse he had for making me well, and many people came to look at me, and there was much talk about the great power of Whirlwind Chaser, who had made me well all at once when I was almost the same as dead. Everybody was glad that I was living, but as I lay there thinking about the wonderful place where I had been and all that I had seen, I was very sad, for it seemed to me that everybody ought to know about it, but I was afraid to tell, because I knew that nobody would believe me, little as I was, for I was only nine years old. Also, as I lay there thinking of my vision, I could see it all again, and feel the meaning with a part of me like a strange power glowing in my body. But when the part of me that talks would try to make words for the meaning, it would be like fog and get away from me. I am sure now that I was then too young to understand it all, and that I only felt it. It was the pictures I remembered and the words that went with them, for nothing I have ever seen with my eyes was so clear and bright as what my vision showed me and no words that I have ever heard with my ears were like the words I heard. I did not have to remember these things. They have remembered themselves all these years. It was as I grew older that the meanings came clearer and clearer out of the pictures and the words, and even now I know that more was shown to me than I can tell. That evening of the day when I came back, Whirlwind Chaser, who had got a great name and a good horse for curing me, came over to our teepee. He sat down and looked at me a long time in a strange way, and then he said to my father, Your boy there is sitting in a sacred manner. I do not know what it is, but there is something special for him to do, for just as I came in, I could see a power like a light all through his body. While he was looking hard at me, I wanted to get up and run away, for I was afraid he might look right into me and see my vision there and tell it wrong, and then maybe all the people would think that I was crazy. For a long while after that, whenever I saw Whirlwind Chaser coming, I would run away and hide for fear that he might see into me and tell. The next morning, all the swelling had left my face and legs and arms, and I felt well as ever but everything around me seemed strange, and as though it were far away. I remember that for twelve days after that I wanted to be alone, and it seemed I did not belong to my people. They were almost like strangers. I would be out alone away from the village and the other boys, and I would look around to the four quarters, thinking of my vision and wishing I could get back there again. I would go home to eat, but I could not make myself eat much, and my father and mother thought that I was sick yet, but I was not. I was only homesick for the place where I had been. I could not tell what I had seen and heard even to my mother's father, refused to go. Although before that I used to think that I could tell him anything, for he liked everything a boy could like, and there was no end to the wonderful things he would tell. It was he who made the first bow I ever had, and he always had more arrows ready for me when I had lost all those that he had given me. I loved my father, but refused to go was different, and I used to be with him a great deal. This was the first thing I could not tell him. One day during this time I was out with the bow and arrows my grandfather had made for me, and as I walked along thinking of my vision, suddenly I felt queer 
and for a little while it seemed that the bow and arrows were those that the first grandfather in the flaming rainbow teepee had given me. Then they were only those that refused to go had made, and I felt foolish and tried to make myself think it was all only a dream anyway. So I thought I would forget about it and shoot something. There was a bush and a little bird sitting in it, but just as I was going to shoot, I felt queer again, and remembered that I was to be like a relative with the birds, so I did not shoot. Then I went on down toward a creek, feeling foolish because I had let the little bird go, and when I saw a green frog sitting there, I just shot him right away. But when I picked him up by the legs, I thought, now I have killed him, and it made me want to cry. Standing Bear Speaks I remember the time when my friend here was sick. I was four years older than he was. I am Minikonju, but our mothers were cousins and we used to play together when our bands were camping in one place. It was at the headwaters of the greasy grass, Little Bighorn. Everybody in the village was well, and so was Black Elk. The next thing I heard was that he was dying and just breathing a little. Everybody was excited over it, and they sent him for medicine to other bands. But nobody knew what the sickness was. I saw him during this time. He looked dead, and everybody was talking about him. Then he was well all at once, and everybody wondered and talked about it. I remember, too, how it was after he got up. Right after that, we moved camp to the mouth of Willow Creek, south about two days. And while the village was moving, I rode back to where the smaller boys were in the rear, for I wanted to see my young friend. I said to him, How, younger brother, you got well after all. And he said, How, yes, I am not sick at all now. But as we rode along together and talked, he was not like a boy. He was more like an old man. And I can remember his father talking to my father in our teepee while we were eating one evening. He said something like this, Since my boy was sick, he is not the same boy. He has queer ways and he does not like to be at home. I feel sorry about the way he is, poor boy. Then we went on a big hunt and the people did not talk about it anymore. Black Elk continues, Yes, we went on a big hunt after we had been at Willow Creek a while, and it helped me to quit thinking about my vision all the time. One morning the crier came around the circle of the village calling out that we were going to break camp. The advisors were in the council teepee, and he cried to them, The advisors, come forth to the center and bring your fires along. It was their duty to save fire for the people, because we had no matches then. Now take it down, down, the crier shouted and all the people began taking down their teepees and packing them on pony drags. Then the crier said, Many bison I have heard, many bison I have heard. Your children, you must take care of them. He meant to keep the children close while traveling, so that they would not scare the bison. Then we broke camp and started in formation, the four advisors first, a crier behind them, the chiefs next and then the people with the loaded pony drags in a long line, and the herd of ponies following. I was riding near the rear with some of the smaller boys, and when the people were going up a long hill, I looked ahead and it made me feel queer again for a little while, because I remembered the nation walking in a sacred manner on the red road in my vision. But this was different, and I forgot about it soon, for something exciting was going to happen, and even the ponies seemed to know. After we had been traveling a while, we came to a place where there were many turnips growing, and the crier said, Take off your loads and let your horses rest. Take your sticks and dig turnips for yourselves. And while the people were doing this, the advisors sat on a hill nearby and smoked. Then the crier shouted, Put on your loads, and soon the village was moving again. When the sun was high, the advisors found a place to camp, where there was wood and also water, and while the women were cooking all around the circle, I heard people saying that the scouts were returning, 
and over the top of a hill I saw three horsebacks coming. They rode to the council teepee in the middle of the village, and all the people were going there to hear. I went there too, and got up close so that I could look in between the legs of men. The crier came out of the council teepee and said, Speaking to the people for the scouts, I have protected you, and in return you shall give me many gifts. The scouts then sat down before the door of the teepee, and one of the advisers filled the sacred pipe with Chakun Shasha, the bark of the red willow, and set it on a bison chip in front of him, because the bison was sacred and gave us both food and shelter. Then he lit the pipe, offered it to the four quarters, to the spirit above, and to Mother Earth, and passing it to the scouts, he said, The nation has depended upon you. Whatever you have seen, maybe it is for the good of the people you have seen. The scouts smoked, meaning that they would tell the truth. Then the advisor said, At what place have you stood and seen the good? Report it to me, and I will be glad. One of the scouts answered, You know where we started from. We went and reached the top of a hill, and there we saw a small herd of bison. He pointed as he spoke. The advisor said, Maybe on the other side of that you have seen the good. Report it. The scout answered, On the other side of that we saw a second and larger herd of bison. Then the advisor said, I shall be thankful to you. Tell me all that you have seen out there. The scout replied, On the other side of that there was nothing but bison all over the country. The advisor said, Hachatu alo. Then the crier shouted like singing, Your knives shall be sharpened, your arrows shall be sharpened. Make ready, make haste, your horses make ready. We shall go forth with arrows, plenty of meat we shall make. Everybody began sharpening knives and arrows and getting the best horses ready for the great making of meat. Then we started for where the bison were. The soldier band went first, riding twenty abreast and anybody who dared to go ahead of them would get knocked off his horse. They kept order, and everybody had to obey. After them came the hunters, riding five abreast. The people came up in the rear. Then the headman of the advisers went around picking out the best hunters with the fastest horses, and to these he said, Good young warriors, my relatives, your work I know is good. What you do is good always, so today you shall feed the helpless. Perhaps there are some old and feeble people without sons, or some who have little children and no man. You shall help these, and whatever you kill shall be theirs. This was a great honor for young men. Then when we had to come near to where the bison were, the hunters circled around them, and the cry went up, as in a battle. Hokahe! which meant to charge. Then there was a great dust, and everybody shouted, and all the hunters went in to kill, every man for himself. They were all nearly naked, with their quivers full of arrows hanging on their left sides, and they would ride right up to a bison and shoot him behind the left shoulder. Some of the arrows would go in up to the feathers, and sometimes those that struck no bones went right straight through. Everybody was very happy. Standing Bear Speaks I remember that hunt, for before that time I had only killed a calf. I was thirteen years old and supposed to be a man, so I made up my mind I'd get a yearling. One of them went down a draw, and I raced after him on my pony. My first shot did not seem to hurt him at all, but my pony kept right after him, and the second arrow went in halfway. I think I hit his heart, for he began to wobble as he ran and blood came out of his nose. Hunters cried, Yoo-hoo, once when they killed, but this was my first big bison and I just kept on yelling, Yoo-hoo, people must have thought I was killing a whole herd, the way I yelled. When he went down, I got off my horse and began butchering him myself, and I was very happy, all over the flat. As far as I could see, there were men butchering bison now, and the women and the old men who could not hunt were coming up to help, 
and all the women were making the tremolo of joy for what the warriors had given them. That was in the moon of red cherries, July. It was a great killing. Black Elk continues. I was well enough to go along on my pony, but I was not old enough to hunt. So we little boys scouted around and watched the hunters. And when we would see a bunch of bison coming, we would yell, Yoo-hoo! like the others, but nobody noticed us. When the butchering was all over, they hung the meat across the horses' backs and fastened it with strips of fresh bison hide. On the way back to the village, all the hunting horses were loaded, and we little boys who could not wait for the feast helped ourselves to all the raw liver we wanted. Nobody got cross when we did this. During this time, women back at camp were cutting long poles and forked sticks to make drying racks for the meat. When the hunters got home, they threw their meat in piles on the leaves of trees. Then the advisers all went back into the council teepee, and from all directions the people came bringing gifts of meat to them, and the advisers all cried, hia a a after which they sang for those who had brought them the good gifts. And when they had eaten all they could, the crier shouted to the people, All come home, it is more than I can eat. And people from all over the camp came to get a little of the meat that was left over. The women were all busy cutting the meat into strips and hanging it on the racks to dry. You could see red meat hanging everywhere. The people feasted all night long and danced and sang. Those were happy times. There was a war game that we little boys played after a big hunt. We went out a little way from the village and built some grass teepees, playing we were enemies and this was our village. We had an advisor, and when it got dark, he would order us to go and steal some dried meat from the big people. He would hold a stick up to us, and we had to bite off a piece of it. If we bit a big piece, we had to get a big piece of meat, and if we bit a little piece, we did not have to get so much. Then we started for the big people's village, crawling on our bellies, and when we got back without getting caught, we would have a big feast and a dance, and make kill talks, telling of our brave deeds like warriors. Once, I remember, I had no brave deed to tell. I crawled up to a leaning tree beside a teepee and there was meat hanging on the limbs. I wanted a tongue I saw up there in the moonlight, so I climbed up. But just as I was about to reach it, the man in the teepee yelled, Ya a a He was saying this to his dog, who was stealing some meat too. But I thought the man had seen me, and I was so scared I fell out of the tree and ran away crying. Then we used to have what we called a chapped breast dance. Our advisor would look us over to see whose breast was burned most from not having it covered with the robe we wore, and the boy chosen would lead the dance while we all sang like this. I have a chapped breast, my breast is red, my breast is yellow. And we practiced endurance, too. Our advisor would put dry sunflower seeds on our wrists. They were lit at the top, and we had to let them burn clear down to the skin. They hurt and made sores, but if we knocked them off or cried, Oh, we would be called women. Chapter 5 At the Soldier's Town After all the meat was dried, the six bands of our nation that had come together about the time when the great vision came to me broke camp at the mouth of Willow Creek and scattered in all directions. A small part of our band, the Ogallalas, started south for the soldier's town on Smoky Earth River, the White, for some of our relatives were there, and we wanted to see them and have a feast of Aguiapi and Peasuta Sapa with Chahumpiska in it. All the rest of the Ogallalas stayed in the country with Crazy Horse, who would have nothing to do with the Wasichus. This was late in the moon when the cherries are ripe, July, and we boys had a good time playing. There were not many boys in our small band, and we all played together. I had quit thinking about my vision. The queer feeling had left me, and I was not bashful anymore, but whenever a thunderstorm was coming I felt happy, as though somebody were coming to visit me. We camped first on Powder River, then on the headwaters of the North Folk, 
of Good River, the Cheyenne, where there is a big butte that we called Sits with Young One because it has a little butte beside it. Then we camped on Driftwood Creek, then on the plain of pine trees, and next on Plum Creek. When we got there, the plums were turning red, but they were not quite ripe yet. My grandfather went out and got some big red ones, and they tasted good. When we got to War Bonnet Creek, which is not very far from the soldier's town, my aunt and other relatives were there waiting for us with bread and coffee, and we had a big feast. I was sick all that night, and the next day my parents made me ride on a pony drag, because they were afraid I would surely die this time. But I think it was only too much bread and coffee, and maybe the plums. We camped again at Hip Sill, and by this time most of our people from the soldier's town were among us. The next day about twenty teepees of us went on, and the rest stayed back. We camped with our relatives by White Butte, near the soldier's town, and stayed there all winter, and we had a good time sliding downhill with sleds made out of bison jaws and ribs tied together with rawhide. I was ten years old that winter, and that was the first time I ever saw Wasichu. At first I thought they all looked sick, and I was afraid they might just begin to fight us any time, but I got used to them. That winter one of our boys climbed the flagpole and chopped it off near the top. This almost made bad trouble, for the soldiers surrounded us with their guns, but Red Cloud, who was living there, stood right in the middle without a weapon and made speeches to the Wasichus and to us. He said the boy who did it must be punished, and he told the Wasichus it was foolish for men to want to shoot grown people because their little boys did foolish things in play. And he asked them if they ever did foolish things for fun when they were boys, so nothing happened after all. Red Cloud was a great chief, and he was an Ogallala, but at this time he was through with fighting, after the treaty he made with the Wasichus five years before, in 1868. He never fought again, and he was living with his band, the Bad Faces, at the Soldier's Town. Crazy Horse was an Ogallala too, and I think he was the greatest chief of all. In the moon of the red grass appearing, April, about thirty teepees of us broke camp and started for the Black Hills to cut teepee poles. We followed down Horsehead Cutting Creek to its mouth and while we were camped there one day I was away from the village alone, when I heard a spotted eagle whistle. I looked up, and there he was, hovering over me. The queer feeling came back very strong, and for a little while it seemed that I was in the world of my vision again. From there we moved on to Buffalo Gap at the foot of the hills, and my father and I went out alone to look for deer. We climbed up through the timber to the top of a big hill, and it was hard for my father, who was lame from the wound he got in the Battle of the Hundred Slain. When we were on top, my father looked down and said, There are some yonder. You stay here, and I will go around them. Then the queer feeling came back, and I said without knowing why I said it, No, father, stay here, for they are bringing them to us. He looked at me hard and said, who is bringing them? I could not answer, and after he had looked hard at me again, he said, All right, son. So we lay down there in the grass and waited. They did come to us, and my father got two of them. While we were butchering and I was eating some liver, I felt sorry that we had killed these animals and thought that we ought to do something in return. So I said, Father, should we not offer one of these to the wild things? He looked hard at me again for a while, then he placed one of the deer with its head to the east, and, facing the west, he raised his hand and cried, Hey, hey, four times, and prayed like this, Grandfather, the Great Spirit, behold me to all the wild things that eat flesh. This I have offered that my people may live and the children grow up with plenty. That was another happy summer, for the big trouble had not come yet. We cut plenty of teepee poles up along the creeks that came down the east side of the Black Hills. And there was all we wanted to eat, for the hills were like a big food pack for our people. Iron Bull, a little boy my age, 
and I had great fun fishing. We always made an offering of bait to the fish, saying, You who are down in the water with wings of red, I offer this to you, so come hither. Then when we caught the first fish, we would put it on a forked stick and kiss it. If we did not do this, we were sure the others would know and stay away. If we caught a little fish, we would kiss it and throw it back, so that it would not go and frighten the bigger fish. I don't know whether all this helped or not, but we always got plenty of fish, and our parents were proud of us. We tried to catch as many as we could so that people would think much of us. There was a man by the name of Watanye, who was good at spearing fish, and he had very sore lips so that he did not dare to laugh. They were cracked all around his mouth. People would try to make him laugh, but he would just walk away from them. One day he said to me, Younger brother, I will show you how to spear fish. So we went up the creek, and there was a fish this long, to his elbow, lying in a pool. Take the spear, Watanye said, and strike deep, for they are always farther down than they look. I took the spear and thrust with it as hard as I could, but the clear water was much deeper than it seemed. I missed and went over head first into the cold pool. When I scrambled out, Watanye was all doubled up, hugging his belly and going, ha, ha, ha. Blood was running down his chin. He ran away as fast as he could, and for a long while after that, whenever he saw me coming, he would turn and run, so that he would not have to laugh again. Once I hid in a bush until he came along, just to see him run when I jumped out. I think Watanye liked me a good deal because he often used to take me out alone to fish or hunt, and he was always teaching me things. Also, he liked to tell me stories, mostly funny ones when he did not have sore lips. I still remember one story he told me about a young Lakota called High Horse, and what a hard time he had getting the girl he wanted. Watanye said the story happened just as he told it, and maybe it did. If it did not, it could have, just as well as not. I will tell that story now.